Hello everyone, welcome again to Pluralsight Spotlight. I'm your host today, Adam Gunn. If you're new to the series, let me set the table for today's incredible interview. Our Spotlight series is a chance to meet some of the incredible people that differentiate the Pluralsight platform. Our brand is built on the back of some incredible authors who bring the best of themselves to the courses they create on the platform each and every day. My guest today is Axel Sorota. Axel is a Microsoft certified trainer with a passion for deep learning and machine learning operations. He is co-founder of Data Trainers, which provides customized workforce training and consultancy. He has a master's degree in mathematics and works in AI and cloud consulting, as well as being an author and instructor on both Pluralsight and O'Reilly. Axel, welcome to the spotlight. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to be here. You come to us all the way from Argentina, right? Yes, indeed, I am. What's it like to be a technologist in Argentina these days? Being in Argentina is complex. Yeah. Especially with the current economical situation. Being a technologist, although it's quite a thriving situation because many people, many digital nomads are actually coming to Argentina to pass a month, know the place because we have beautiful nature places and also leverage the economical situation to, for themselves. Uh, so we have lots of meetups and you can go and meet awesome people. For example, the week before coming here, I met someone from Romania that was here for three months, just working from home, quote unquote. We like to dive into the the backstory of some of the fascinating people we have in the spotlight. How did you get on a technology journey for your career? Well, it was unintentional, to be honest. Um, so the long story short, I was studying I was studying math alongside biology. I had a major on both, and I went homeless. So I had to find a job and I applied everywhere. And luckily, one of the places that called me back was was for a, I think it was a, po a position in finance. And I said, finance, numbers, mathematics, I can do it, right? And luckily, the recruiter, uh, he was, it was an, an IT company, said, no, I think that you can do something within IT. So I had the weirdest interview of, the CTO coming, trying to talk about, hey, we have these performance issues, I think that you can help. And that's how I entered IT. So it was an astonishing amount of luck because it wasn't in my plans. I didn't know anything about programming then. And I had to be self-taught after that to be remaining in the job. Okay. I have to go back. You went homeless? Yes. That's intense. Um. It happens when your parents die and you can't stay at the home. Okay. It's fascinating. Do you find that foundation of mathematics has helped you on this journey? Like how Absolutely. would you how would you describe that? So let me tell you this. And I always tell everyone, all my students, everyone at the university, so mathematics it's everywhere. It depends up to us how we want to tackle it, right? So for example, and this is the obvious example in deep learning and machine learning, you can take it to the API level. I have a model, it's, uh, it's imported and I can use it. But if you go further down, it's an actual formula and it's an optimization problem. If you take it further down, there are theorems that attack that, that show us why they work and what cannot work and what can work. So it depends on your level of mathematics and what you want to do with it. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean that it's some kind of obscure magic that gurus only master. Anyone can know the mathematics of machine learning or the mathematics needed for technology. For example, in, if you want to do software engineer, you want to do Java programming, you may say, hey, mathematics doesn't help me at all. But it's not like that because mathematics is built up on logic and everything in programming is logic. Yeah. So it helps us shape your train of thought in a, in a way. I don't know if it makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome. I want to transition to your passion for teaching and consulting. My assumption is that's 
what led you to Plural Sight. Um, Absolutely. Where, when did that? When did that kind of originate for you? Well, that originated back when I was at the university, and I was a TA for many many years. Uh, if I have, to, I don't remember right now. I have to count, but at least seven years, uh, both at ma at the mathematics department teaching linear algebra, differential equations, you know, the gist, and also at the ecology department, because remember, I was also studying biology. I never finished the thesis, so I don't have the actual degree, <laughs> but I did everything within it. And I loved the A ah moment. So, so I was a ProSite user back then. I was working at Salesforce, Salesforce has a license with ProSite, so I was a ProSite user. And I had a three hour uh, commute to, to Salesforce offices. So I always put some Pluralsight uh, video and started learning. And that plus the ah moment, I said, hey, maybe I could do this. But I was getting, I was ha finishing my thesis. So when I finished my thesis, and this is, trust me, believe me, this is, I swear to God, November 18th, I got my degree, November 19th, I was submitting for Pluralsight. I got the email from, I think it was, uh, I think it was Adam. And then it started the whole process of how to get into Pluralsight. Teaching on Pluralsight is different than teaching in a classroom and that aha moment is different. How do you feel that same aha as a Pluralsight instructor versus a classroom instructor? That's a very good question. Because Pluralsight also does offer professional services, and I'm an instructor there too. So I still maintain the aha moment within a 20 to 25 people classroom within Pluralsight. That's a, the benefit I have been able to taught, to teach, sorry, uh, at least, I think it was a thousand students already within ProServe. But let's talk about the skills platform. So I always tell my students, Let's connect via Twitter. Ask me. Let's talk. That aha moment, it converts itself into that mes message of gratitude. When they got the certification they wanted, when they got the job they wanted, the promotion they wanted, when they could do that that they couldn't do. And you see one of those messages, I don't know, in LinkedIn, and it makes your day. And what I love is when those are out there, I see them too. And I get to see, oh man, Axel is making a difference in, you know, the lives of the Pluralsight community. And, you know, that's, that's so cool. We love seeing those social media it's recognitions of the authors. It's one life at a time. Well, let's talk about some of your courses. Your recent course is on natural language processing in TensorFlow. Share a little bit about NLP and TensorFlow and why you've decided to focus your course on that. That's a very good question. So, well, NLP is the set of techniques to basically extract meaning out of text. So you have text, you have to get it into a numerical format to be able to do something. It can be extract entities, you may be wanting to autocomplete, you may want to answer if it's a question like ChatGPT, you may want to get the sentiment of the whole conversation to know if, for example, if you're in a chat, if the other person is angry at the company. So there are many different applications of NLP. Why TensorFlow? Well, TensorFlow is the biggest framework in, in AI right now. Uh, it's fast, it's compiled, and you can actually serve the models quite fast, quite easily. If you ask me TensorFlow or PyTorch, that's the difficult question. But I don't know, I have installed both on my computer. Yeah. There are many reasons to, to do it in terms of flow. It provides a lot of APIs specifically for NLP that make it really easy to work with it. And that course basically goes from the zero to hero in NLP. That's interesting. And does, do you find that your, you know, Spanish is your native tongue? You speak English very well. You could know multiple languages beyond that. I don't want to assume, but do you find having that multilingual background is is helpful in this more logic-based world? It's 
interesting. So I specialize in NLP within the AI part and I do the NLP courses. You may have heard about models like BERT, BORT, or almost anything that comes from hugging face. The difficult part is that they were trained, usually they need to be trained on a gigantic data set. So normally it's like the whole Wikipedia, all of Google News, all of internet, like, like GPT-3, if you remember that from 2021, but that's in English. So there's a problem. What do we do with Spanish? What do we do with other languages? And there are two paths that you can take, right? Path number one comes to Spanish, translate to English with a, with a it's called sec to sec model, doesn't matter. Do the thing in English because you have your models that work very well in English and then translate back to Spanish. Sounds reasonable, right? Has incredible amount of bias. It has been found that it has gender bias, that it has race bias, that is very difficult to attack, and that you can get things that are really uh, not okay. The classic example that you can see is, for example, Google Photos, when you, you can submit photos of senators that are women, and that when you extract tax out of that, for example, on those models, then the qualities that they get are basically beauty qualities, like, I don't know, beautiful, tall, short, blonde, gray. And when you do the same with a senator that is male, it's businessman, senator, important. So you have that kind of bias and the same goes into that translation models. So you say, oh, okay, I will do it all in, all in Spanish. How do you get embedded in Spanish? That is where the community is actually working right now. There has been a paper that has been actually being shown right now at a conference called Kipu, which is the Latin America conference in, for AI. And, and in that paper, they do a really good work of getting models that are, um, we call them embeddings because they translate words into numbers that we can work with. And they do it with Spanish and with German. And that's the base of actually doing everything within that, that language. So what you have mentioned to me is actually one of the biggest challenges of NLP. Let's talk a bit about chat GPT in the domain of learning. Like, do you have some thoughts on how it will be disruptive to how people learn? My opinions are a little controversial with respect to these type of models. It was with GPT-3 and it is with ChatGPT. It will be with Bohr and all of those models. So the problem with them, uh, they are useful, very useful. You can use them for teaching. You can ask them to explain a quick sort and they will do it. And they will explain the best, for example, the worst case and the best case. And they can explain the complexity. And that's okay because that's a fact. The problem with these models is when you're not going into a fact because they don't have knowledge. The models don't have any kind of knowledge or reasoning. They just apply a function and respond to the most likely response that you will be happy with. So you can force it to say whatever you want. You can force it to be unethical. You can force it to blame and to do worse things. <laughs> you can force it to curse, to say words that are almost forbidden right now in the common language. And yeah. um, you can make it even say that an abacus is faster than a GPU. And there are examples of this. So you have to be extremely careful. I don't want to say power comes with great responsibility, but it's a little bit of that. So people, get into the hype of these models really, really fast. And they say, I will use everything with it and that's going to be the best thing in the world because OpenAI is the coolest company. But you have to be very careful because of this or what I told you that they do not learn, that they, they do not know things. And also the fact that normally they are overfitted models. So they are trained with such a gigantic data set that normally they are overfitted. Until that level of efficiency uh, exists in the world, we're stuck kind of with traditional learning. And we recently did a study with learners and 
Um, we call it our state of upskilling report. And the survey came back and learners, individuals within organizations, they continue to signal that making time or the organization making time to learn is one of the biggest obstacles that they have to upskilling. I'd love your perspective on how you have kind of created a, a, a learning culture in your personal life and maybe any advice you would have to, you know, others. That's a good question. So my situation is a little different, but maybe helps. So as I told you, when I was learning a lot because I was starting as a software engineer, I had a three hour commute. So that was kind of easy, right? It's like you learn via process video or you do nothing for three hours. Yeah. <laughs> and that was every day. However, nowadays it's more difficult to have kids. I have my wife, I have the house. It's of course harder. What I try to do uh, with more or less some kind of success is to leave some time in the morning before everyone wakes up. So there are books around this, for example, uh, on how to wake up at 5, 4.30 and try to really focus on do some learning back then. For me, for example, after that time, it's impossible. Take kids to school, do some things, do some errands, pick kids from school, take them for activities. Then you come back, you have to go make dinner, and that's it, 1 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> so otherwise yeah. it would be impossible. Yeah. What I love about your story is like there are phases of life, right? There are phases in life where you might have a three-hour commute or you might not have kids or you might be living alone in traveling the world. And it sounds like when you had that, you took advantage of that time. Absolutely. And different, Every single different, second. Different life phases, you don't have that. And to think you can create it might actually discourage you. But whatever, whether it's five minutes or three hours, like making that time intentionally and doing it habitually is really important. Yeah, also, well, in my case, I try to incorporate my kids. So now, for example, I made my, for my eldest, I made her a space in the studio. So she's with the iPad and trying to do, well, she's doing an educational uh, application, but still, the good thing is that while I'm doing the learning or trying to do this, she's doing that, so we are together. So, I don't know, trying, yeah. trying to think ways yeah. of trying to do it. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I haven't heard that advice yet. Have an intentional space that's dedicated Oh yeah, she has her learning, space with the iPad together. and everything and the notepad so she can actually take notes. Maybe one last question on learning. Like, do you have a particular learning style that works for you? I have to give you a little context. So my wife has a master's in education. Uh, she works with the government in Argentina at a certain level to design curriculum. And also, of course, it, she teaches at certain schools and the university. So how to teach something is a really common subject on our dinner table. Uh, I am a big, big fan of learning by discovery. So if you check any, any of my courses, especially the latest one, the first ones are horrible, but because of course I was learning how to do courses also. Uh, I put my best effort, but still. But in the latest ones, you will see a lot of, hey, we have this problem very little slides, and then we go to demo. All the course is basically demo, and the demos are not just like clicking and showing something, but okay, let's solve this problem. Okay, stop the video now, try to do it. Go through the process, see what problems do you find, and then come back. So it's not very suitable for commute <laughs> in a sense. But for 90% of the people that watch my courses, I know that they watch them in, the, in their desk. I know that it will resonate with them. So they will say, oh, that's interesting. Maybe they code a little bit. Maybe they just think about it. But thinking about it makes you discover the problem by yourself. And therefore, when you see the solution, you understand why that is a solution that is suitable. And always, 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 I leave homework always so i'm that kind of teacher <laughs> in my courses and all of that is basically on 
keeping the storyline of learning by discovery. You have to discover the problems to be able to grasp and retain, which is the most important part of knowledge, what you have learned. Otherwise, you will just forget it the next day if yeah. you just read it in a slide. Yeah, I'm fascinated. And since you were a customer of Pluralsight before you became an author, are there some authors that you aspire to be like, you were big fans of? Absolutely. So I don't know the very first thing about Angular, but I can tell you that I watch every course from Debra Kurata because I love her style, because she tells the story, and I know that every course that she makes, I can learn something on how to teach a course. Uh, if you ask me more about the specific technical parts, I had a big, big thing for Nigel Pelton. Do you know yeah. him? He has a courses on Docker and Kubernetes, and a lot of things about storage that I haven't seen. At a certain point at my career, I really, really needed to know Docker and Kubernetes. And it was amazing how he taught. Amazing. That's the type of people that you have here. I love that. Well, Axel, thanks so much for joining us. It wouldn't be a spotlight interview if we didn't end with a little randomness here. So I've got okay. some fun <laughs> questions to throw I'm you away. I'm, I'm a math mathematician with a major in statistics. So randomness is part of my life. <laughs> I love it. Okay, well, I'm just going to throw a few of these at you. If you could switch legs with any animal, which would it be? I would say an iguana. <laughs> an iguana? That's yes. a new one. Fascinating. They're very yeah. short legs. They're very short, but they can go really fast. And they have an adaptation that they can actually climb really, really easy. Yeah. yeah. Also, they can support. So do you know that um, they support this kind of volcanic a soil where basically it's it's spiky and it hurts a lot for us. Uh, for example, in Hawaii they call it the ah ah so, uh, type of soil because when you walk through it you do ah ah yeah. ah ah because it hurts. <laughs> well, they have an adaptation so it doesn't hurt them. <laughs> Mac or PC? Mac. Least annoying thing your kids watch on TV that you can tolerate. There's a show, in, it's an Australian show called Bluey. Yeah, a lot of adults love Bluey. That's what I've heard as well. Favorite pizza topping? Pizza in Argentina is different than in the US. It's more like Italian. So we don't put a ton of stuff there. The mo My favorite one would be tomatoes. Okay, little margarita pizza. Your favorite subject in school? That one is easy, <laughs> math. Of course. <laughs> Are you on Team Cat or Team Dog? I'm on Team Plants. Team Plants? Lots of Team Plants. I, I love big, big trees. i um, be able to walk and drink some mate like next to a, a tree. I love that. And if you were a flavor of ice cream, what would? Dulce de leche. Okay. Do you know it? It's from Argentina. Yeah. So it's a thing we have. That's, a, that's very appropriate. Well, Axel, thanks so much for joining us today in the Pluralsight Spotlight. It was fabulous to get to know you and really appreciate you uh, coming to Utah for this interview today. Ah, thank you so much for this. It was awesome. I would just hope my flight back is as good as the flight that got me here. <laughs> Sounds great. And to our audience, I want to thank you for joining us on this uh, episode. We'll put links to Axel's courses in the show notes. We'll hope you'll check those out. Uh, we love your feedback. We'd love a, a follow. And we look forward to you joining us again on a future episode of Portal Site Spotlight. Thanks for joining.